how to supplement vitamin D properly and who should look at supplementing vitamin D. Let's go ahead and break it down because it's not as simple as we might think. Supplementing vitamin D seems like a terrific thing since so many people are deficient in vitamin D. But we have to remember that you can get vitamin D from the sun, you can get vitamin D from food, and you can get it from supplement form. So there's sort of a hierarchy that we need to look at. And how do you go about adding your vitamin D in if you are gonna supplement it? So before we get into that, I wanna cover who is going to be a prime candidate for vitamin D supplementation in an actual supplement form first. Okay, so I wanna get this out in the open first. There's like four types of people that really, really would benefit from vitamin D, okay, in terms of supplementation. Number one, overweight people, okay? I am not a fan of supplementing vitamin D. I'm gonna get right out in the open and say that. I strongly, strongly, strongly stand behind getting it from natural forms as much as you possibly can. But I also understand that we have a vitamin D problem in this world right now. I don't know what the underlying mechanism is, and I think a lot of people are trying to figure out, because we are not getting enough vitamin D. Even people that are in the sun seem like they're not getting enough vitamin D. So I don't think that supplementation is a terrible thing. I think it has its place. But when you're obese or simply overweight, vitamin D gets sequestered in your fat cells, okay? So when you have more fat on your body, vitamin D gets trapped there. There are multiple studies that demonstrate that as subjects lose body fat, vitamin D becomes liberated. And as they lose body fat, vitamin D intake orally and vitamin D from the sun seems to convert in the 20, into the 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, the circulating forms of vitamin D easier. It's not getting sequestered and trapped in the fat. So when you are overweight, however, it's gonna be very hard to get yourself over the goal line or up to that standard via sun and food. It just is. You have all these other things that are standing in your way. So I do feel that taking in vitamin D supplementation in like a 1,000, 2,000 IU form, if you're overweight, could be beneficial until you start losing weight. This is what I find ends up being a problem. People lose 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 pounds. They like how the vitamin D was making them feel, so they continue to take those levels and it's not necessarily about getting to toxic levels of vitamin D. That is up for debate whether it really does even exist. But are you taking a synthetic form that you don't really need? Because there's some evidence that synthetic vitamin D might actually deplete bioavailable retinol A. It can affect, we've seen this in vitro in skin keratinocytes where it actually is affecting bioavailable retinol A, meaning it can affect the eyes, it can affect the effect of vitamin A on the immune system level. I'm not trying to scare you away from taking vitamin D. I just feel like it needs to be a period of time in which you take it to get yourself over a certain hump for people that are overweight. The next one is going to be people that are darker skinned, okay? If you are darker skinned, if you're African American, or if you're just dark complected at all, you have more of a filtration system. See what happens to the sun, the UVB light, it comes in, it hits your skin, and it acts upon the 70 hydrocholesterol as well as DNA and RNA. Well. In order for this first step to occur, you need to have UVB light actually hitting this 7 dihydrocholesterol. Well, you have more melanin and it's acting as a filter. Okay, the same thing that makes you darker skinned, the same thing that makes, in a lot of ways, a good thing because you're used to the sun, that also filters the vitamin D. So that means that you have a harder time getting vitamin D in. And sometimes there's not much that you can do about it because just by simple evolutionary nature, if you are a darker skinned person, your hereditary uh, sun exposure is gonna be much more, right? You, your ancestors are probably in a lot more sunny climates, but maybe you are a dark skinned person living in Seattle, Washington. Okay, do the math. That can be a very bad situation because now you're dark complected, you have this filtration system that's blocking UVB light and subsequent vitamin D, and you're in an area where it's dark and cold and rainy, right? Less vitamin D to begin with that's even available. So that's something to pay attention to. Now that's not something that you can obviously change, right? So you're taking in vitamin D. You might need to take vitamin D in for a while and then slowly wean off of your vitamin D. Slowly wean off of it and kind of test different things, change different lifestyle factors, change your diet, change this, and kind of wean off 1,000 IUs at a time. 
We kind of see how you feel there. The next one is going to be similar to that. It's going to be different uh, religious settings where you're required to be covered up a lot. Okay, that is a very important piece and it's often overlooked. Okay, so different uh, religions are going to deal with this. Same kind of situation as the dark skin, right? It's going to be you're filtering that sun. And then the obvious one that we have to talk about, people that live in darker places. But the reason that I wanted to mention this with the darker places is you don't need to be supplementing vitamin D every day. You don't need to be supplementing vitamin D during the summertime in a lot of these places. If you lived in Alaska, for example, and you have 21 hours, 22 hours of daylight in the summertime, your ability to get vitamin D is going to be much higher than it is in the winter. It's understandable to supplement synthetic vitamin D during the winter, okay? But you don't need to necessarily be supplemented during the summer. So think about this and think about how you allocate your vitamin D uh, synthetic supplementation. Now, in terms of dosing strategy, this is going to vary widely from person to person. People are going to have different responses to synthetic vitamin Ds. What I recommend people do is start, of course, with the sun and the food. Do everything you can there. If that doesn't get your levels up where you want them, then the next step is to bring in cod liver oil. Okay, cod liver oil is going to be bioavailable vitamin D, bioavailable vitamin A, so it's in a very sort of synergistic form. These two fat soluble vitamins that work very well together. So I would start with 500 milligrams to 1000 milligrams of cod liver oil, work your way up to up to 2000 milligrams of cod liver oil. If 2000 milligrams of cod liver oil per day, along with sunlight, along with food, is not getting your vitamin D levels to where you want, then you're at a situation where you can start adding synthetic vitamin D. Now what I usually like to do is go a little bit higher on the dosage of vitamin D to start and then work backwards from there. So what you'd want to do is you typically want to use like 1000 IU capsules or liquid form where you can really dose in 1000 IU situations. And you'd want to start with like 5000 IUs and test your levels and then work your way backwards. And the reason behind this is simply because we don't know the circulating levels of vitamin D. So if you were to start a little bit higher, you would get a better idea if it's overshooting your goal rather than starting super small and undershooting it. But don't start above 5,000 IUs because I feel like that's like the tolerable upper intake for most people before they start seeing their levels go above and beyond what they need. And again, if we take in too much of a synthetic vitamin D, we don't always know the consequences, right? We don't know everything that's going on. But by and large, I think a lot of it's gonna come down to metabolic dysfunction. So we can, if we can overall improve things like our cardiovascular health, if we can improve our mental health, if we can improve our mitochondrial health and like our insulin resistance, if we can improve our levels of body fat, bring those down, I think we might start to see an improvement in overall vitamin D. So I hope this gave a good insight into how to dose it properly to find your magic number. But more than anything, a lot of it is subjective, okay? What your circulating levels of vitamin D are like don't always matter unless you are symptomatic. Remember that. You could have moderately low levels of vitamin D, but if you're not symptomatic, it might not need to be changed. Just like testosterone. If your testosterone levels are low, but you're not symptomatic, don't change anything. But if they're low and you're symptomatic, that's when you have a problem. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.